All right, all right. What's up, everybody? Great to see you. Welcome to all locations, everybody online. Love you. Thanks so much for joining us. If you're a guest, I'm Jared. I have the joy of getting to be the senior pastor around here, so thank you for being here. And as you've seen, we are in a series on Revelation, and we are wrapping that up next weekend. So for trust me, come back for next weekend, all right? We got a rocky ride today, and the next week we're going to end in celebration and in the sunlight, if you will. So let me pray, and we'll dig in. Lord, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would minister to our hearts today. I pray that there would be a, a conviction, a sobering of our hearts today of your great power and your mysterious will. And I pray for anyone under the sound of my voice, if they are not believers in you, I pray today is their day of salvation. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, you know, you know, I can't come to a series on Revelation and not bring this out now. You know, you gotta, it's been a while. And if you're a guest with us, we call this the church mascot, the blue tape rope. So if you picture with me uh, this rope going that way nonstop and then the rope going that way nonstop, like eternity, and then picture this little piece of blue tape, your life. This is it. This is all you have on this earth. Uh, 80, 90 years if you eat kimchi, maybe longer than that. But this is you. 90 years, 80 years, and it matters what happens with your life. So as you hear this message today, you got to keep in mind the, the brevity of your life and then what it means for you to trust or not trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So let's go for it. A little bit of review. So we began the series. We saw the apocalypse of Jesus and Jesus, just meaning Jesus and all his glory, Jesus and his power unlike we've ever seen in scripture. We see that Jesus gives a message to who's called the seven churches for them to love not their lives unto death, to be repentant, to be faithful to him. Then we saw heaven and this scroll in heaven that would lead to the conclusion of God's will for humanity, but no one in heaven was worthy to take the scroll and break open its seals. I tell my kids, think of pieces of tape, there's seven seals, until Jesus took the scroll and all of heaven lost its mind in worship over Jesus, our King. Then he starts to break open these seals on the scroll, and with each seal came a judgment. So we saw the seven judgments from the seals, and then those released, like fireworks, you know, fireworks and more fireworks, released the judgments of the trumpets. And then fast forward to last week, we saw the seven bowls of judgment, and those were the final, most intense, final judgments of God upon the earth, and that leads us to where we are today. Now, what's happening throughout all these judgments uh, is what's called the seven years of tribulation. So Jesus came back already leading into this and we'll come back to, and we will, those born again in Christ will meet him in the air. It's called, it's called the rapture, but the word is harpazo in Greek. It means to be snatched up, to be taken away. So Jesus will return in the clouds. If we're, if we're here, we'll, we'll go up to be with him in the clouds. The dead in Christ, though, will rise first. That simply means when you die, you're, to be apart from the body means to be in the presence of the Lord. So the souls that are with Christ, their bodies will be reassembled in some way, and then they will join those souls in heaven, and there we will be with the Lord forever. So while we're in heaven, last week we talked about the marriage supper of the Lamb. Over those seven years, there's feasting, there's rejoicing, there's singing, there's celebrating in our time with Jesus. And while that's going on in se for seven years in heaven, there's seven years of judgment being poured out on the earth on the eve and depravity of humanity. So we've seen this seven years of tribulation all the way up to where we are today. So you got to understand, this is where I hope you got some caffeine running through your veins today because you got to think with me today. So you had the first coming of Jesus, which is Christmas. Then you have the rapture. The rapture is not the second coming. That's what you got to keep clear. The rapture is just the rapture. So the first coming is Christmas coming. Then there's the rapture that will happen. Seven years of this tribulation takes place, and at the end of the seven years is the second coming of Jesus. So think of Jesus on earth. The first coming is Christmas. The second coming is when he comes back to earth, second coming. Now, this is huge in the Bible. Second coming, think of it this way, that the second coming of Jesus 
For every eight references to the Christmas coming of Jesus, I'm sorry, to every one reference to the Christmas coming of Jesus, there are eight references to the second coming of Jesus. Also, there's 1,800 Bible references regarding the second coming of Jesus, 17 Old Testament books talk about the, old, the second coming of Jesus. One out of every 30 verses in the New Testament speak to the second coming of Jesus. 23 out of 27 of the New Testament books speak to the second coming of Jesus. And then finally, Jesus speaks of his second coming 21 times. So this is huge, what we're hearing today. In his second coming to the earth, and especially what follows it, and what that's gonna mean for your soul, and for mine. So let's jump in. We were, last week, we were in several chapters, but in Revelation chapter 16, we see the seven years of tribulation are over, and here's what begins to happen to, to kind of conclude it. We met the unholy trinity, which is first the Antichrist. He shows up on the scene before the tribulation and the rapture happens. He brings peace to the Middle East. And then the false prophet shows up with his ideology and his false religions and spirituality. It deceives the nations to trust in and believe in this Antichrist is like a, a savior, a messiah for the world. And then everything goes wrong. Judgments come and so forth. And the unholy trinity being ultimately Satan, the Antichrist, and this false prophet. And then it says that in these final moments that they, we'll pick it up at verse 13, they are demonic spirits, this persuasion that goes out from their leadership, performing signs, these are spiritual kind of signs, who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. So even if you're not a believer, you've probably heard the phrase, the battle of Armageddon. This is toward the end, after the tribulation, in which the nations begin to, to descend upon God's people, Israel, to wipe them out. Last week, we talked about the Euphrates River. It was blood, then it was dried up, opened the way for mi these Middle Eastern nations to cross over and take Israel out. We see rumblings of that even today. But this battle is when all nations begin to descend upon God's people. And here's a picture of the plain of Megiddo right here. So in this plain of Megiddo, you see how big it is. And this isn't the whole picture. See how very flat it is. So it's very uh, on purpose of where God's going to make this battle in his sovereign way happen in this place. Now what we do, we're going to jump over to the Old Testament a little bit. There's so many places, there's so much in the New Testament about this. There's Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel. There's the book of Isaiah. I'm going to go to, go to the book of Zechariah because it's more concise. It's going to save us some time. So we see in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 2, how this begins to unfold prophetically. It says that God will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken and the houses plundered and the women raped. Half of the city shall go out into exile, but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. So these awful nations and their rebellion against God committing these heinous war crimes because God has removed the instraining influence of his Holy Spirit. And in verse 3, we see, we see this, that the Lord then will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. And there's many battles of the Lord in the Old Testament that you can see. Also in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus prophesies of what this is going to look like in his own words. is that he will come back, and when he comes back, there will be a lightning flash from east to west, and this strange twilight that takes place, and that uh, the heavenlies will swirl around him, and he'll be coming back on the clouds of power and glory to battle these evil empires. And that's where we go back to Revelation 19 and pick it up in verse 11. John says, I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and the one sitting on it is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and he makes war. So Jesus is no pacifist here. He is bringing war on the, those who have lived in their depravity and have defied God in all these ways. In a, Revelation chapter 6, verse 2, if you've been on the series, we'll see that there was another one who rode on a white horse, and he's the Antichrist. So remember, Satan's always trying to copy what God does. So the Antichrist comes back on a, or comes on a white horse in the, in the image of conquering the nations, conquering hearts and minds through deception. But now Jesus comes, the true Messiah comes on this white horse to bring war and to conquer enemies against him and against his people. 
Verse 12, his eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. So these eyes that once wept over sin, these eyes that once wept over the death of his friend Lazarus, now they're on fire with judgment, this final judgment. Many diadems, that means many crowns. So picture all the nations and these kings with their crowns. Now Jesus owns all the crowns as the final ultimate king of the world. He has a name written that no one knows. That means there's realities about Jesus and his person that we're gonna get to know him forever and ever and ever. And then it goes on to say, he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood and the name by which he is called is the word of God. I love this image that Jesus' robe is dipped in blood. It's his own blood. It shows us how we'll see Jesus forever. Jesus will keep his scars, hands and feet, and the crown of thorns that was on his head. We're going to see those scars forever. Now, instead of a crown of thorns, he's got the crown overall, over the universe and the heavenlies. We're also going to see a robe in blood. We're going to be reminded forever the lengths God has gone to to win your heart that Jesus came back to die on the cross for you, pouring out his blood as the lamb who was slain so that under his blood you are are safe under his presence and that eternal death will pass over you and there through faith in what he did on the cross, the wrath of God he took for you and me in his resurrection and reigning at the right hand of God, the promise that we will be with him and see him for what he's done forever and ever. That's why heaven loses its mind in worship when the lamb who was slain takes this scroll, man. What a savior. And also he's called the word of God. This means that he is God. John wrote earlier in a letter, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, in that letter he wrote that Jesus was the word of God and God. So Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Trinity, one times one times one equals one. And Jesus being God, Hebrews chapter one, God the Father calls Jesus God. And we see him here as the word of God. He's the source of life. Whenever I see the phrase, the word of God, I just hold my Bible a little closer because this is the word of God we have today in the Holy Spirit of Christ that teaches us. That's why I hope you're holding on to your Bible dearly to your heart and that you're in your Bible, you're reading it, you're immersing your life in it and letting it guide you. Then we see in verse 14, and the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. That's you. For those of you who have placed your faith in Christ and you've been raptured to be, or or you died to be in his presence and now your bodies are given and you're literally riding in victory. And notice you're not riding beside Jesus. Uh, You're behind him because the battle belongs to the Lord. And he's gonna be fighting that on your behalf and you and I get to be a witness to it. So here he is, strange war clothes here, white linen. What are you doing with that? Just means Jesus is going to do it all. And notice that they're following him. How you know you'll follow Jesus then is if you're following Jesus right now. Because in Luke, the letter of Luke and Matthew actually, Jesus said, for for anyone who would have him, you must deny yourself, carry your cross, and follow him. So that means when you place faith in Jesus, there's a transformation that begins to happen in you that you want to deny yourself, deny your desires that are against God, deny your feelings of my truth is my truth. No, because there's only one truth and his name is Jesus. So you deny the self and then you carry your cross. You carry his identity in your life and for his glory, following him. Are you following him today? Verse 15 From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. Oh, we got to talk about this for a minute. This ruling the nations with a rod of iron, these are the rebellious, the the anti-God, anti-his people nations. He's going to rule it with power, a rod of iron. If you go to Psalm chapter 2, there's a prophecy of this happening. Well, there's a call to bow down and kiss the feet of Christ the Lord, lest he be angry in his wrath. Then there's this passage in verse four that says, he is seated enthroned on the heavens who then laughs and scoff at these empires that are turning on him. What an image. He's laughing at them. 
You know what scoffing means? To make fun of. This is Jesus laughing and making fun of these empires that are coming after him. And then it comes to verse 16, one of my favorite verses in this. It says, and on his robe and on his thigh, he has written, King of kings and Lord of lords. What a tattoo. <laughs> on his thigh. And think about that. You got to picture that with me for a moment. If he's on the horse and he's riding in victory, those who are fighting against him on the ground, the, le- the thigh is about eye level. So when they see Christ, they see his thigh, and there's a declaration, you're fighting the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And the battles of the day, often what warriors would do is they would strap a a sword or a knife, a saber, to their thigh, and that saber would have etched in it the name of the warrior. Well, Jesus doesn't need a sword. He's got his name. He's the king of kings, and he's the Lord of lords. So you're getting the impression for anybody who's going to fight against Jesus, it's going to go bad for them. Then there's kind of this trash talk, Revelation 19. You see this with Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, almost if he's chuckling that there will be vultures already circling the valley of Megiddo, already circling for what Jesus is about to do to these warriors, these enemies. In verse 19, it says, I saw the beast, this is the Antichrist, and the kings of the earth who trusted in him and follow him and worship him, thinking he's the answer for all the world's troubles, with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the throne and against his army. The measure of the human heart and how hard it can become that they think they can actually go toe-to-toe with the king. Verse 20, and the beast, the Antichrist, was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in his presence had done the signs, the the spiritual signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. Let me just remind us one more time, deceived, deceived, deceived is repeated over and over again. Are you being deceived right now in any way? How do you keep from being deceived? The word of God. This is the only way you will not be deceived is you lay your feelings, your desires, your your mind, your heart, all that you are, you lay up on it and you don't interpret scripture from you. You let scripture interpret you and let it speak to that. And anybody who's coming out saying, well, you know, that's not really the interpretation and this was something added 500 years ago, forget that. Go read it like a child for what God meant it to be. Then it says, these two were thrown alive, Antichrist, false prophet, thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse and all the birds were gorged on their flesh. What an image. This lake of fire that burns with sulfur. Why is it always adding with sulfur? You ever smelled sulfur? What a stench. It's a nod to saying that all of one's senses will be fully alive, even in this kind of torment. And the sword that comes out of his mouth, again, I don't know if you've been here. I used to think as a kid, it was like a sword would go, right? And he's just like cutting people down with his head. That's not what it is. It's meaning he's speaking judgment and and, and that judgment really shredding people, uh, and not literally, but in terms of whatever excuse they have, no, it's over. Whatever rationalizations of why they didn't believe, it's over. It's pure judgment now. Now, this all happened on the horse of victory. And now we see Jesus step off the horse and he steps on what's called the Mount of Olives. We're back to Zechariah. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split into from east to west by a very wide valley so that one half of the Mount shall move northward and the other half southward. So notice the words east and Mount of Olives. So let me show you this picture right here. So if you look at this, Where we're standing in terms of looking at the picture, this is like us standing on the Mount of Olives and we're looking east. And notice what's right there. That's right in the middle of the picture. That's the east gate. A lot happened in Jesus' day on the Mount of Olives and this east gate. 
First of all, on the Mount of Olives before Jesus went to the cross, he spent a lot of time on the Mount of Olives. He prayed a lot on the Mount of Olives. Also before he went to the cross, Palm Sunday happened there and Holy Week that led to his death and resurrection. Palm Sunday meaning he rode a donkey. So before he rides a white horse in war, remember he rode a donkey to show his humility and love to win people's hearts. He rode that, that donkey down from the Mount of Olives through that east gate right there, really declaring that he's God and the Messiah they're all searching for. So that happened. Also on the Mount of Olives is the Garden of Gethsemane. And on the Garden of Gethsemane is where Jesus sweated blood before he was going to the cross to show his love and salvation for you and for me. Now that happened on the Mount of Olives. And then also finally, after he died on the cross and he was resurrected, he came back to the Mount of Olives and ascended to heaven and said, like I went, I am coming back. So this is his second coming to come back. And what does Zechariah say is going to happen? His toe is going to touch the Mount of Olives. And as soon as it touches, it's going to blow it apart. From north and south, it's going to blow it apart. And he's going to, he's going to go right down through there, through that east gate. I don't, know if he's going to, I don't know if he's going to do something like that or if he's going to... Sorry, uh, he's not going to do that. Uh, but he's going to go right down through that east gate to reign in the new temple. Huge. Let me show you a close-up of this gate. So this is a close-up of the eastern gate right there. In around the 1500s, there was a Muslim conqueror known as Suleiman the Magnificent. In thinking that the Jewish Messiah was coming to reign, he filled the east gate full of 16 feet of cement, thinking he could stop Jesus. And not only that, if you look closely on the ground there, those are Muslim tombs. And he thought burying Muslims there would prevent Jesus the Messiah from going through the gate. But what have we learned? As soon as Jesus touches the Mount of Olives, boom, it's all going to split wide open. and He's going to move right through that gate to reign. Jesus is unstoppable. This is good news for us. And this is why he spoke a lot of his second coming in this way. Now, when Jesus gets to this moment, split, he's reigning, Jerusalem, we as born-again believers and Old Testament uh, believers in J Jesus the Messiah, we now come with him to reign with him in what's called the 1,000-year reign of Jesus, the millennium reign. And this is where you got to dig in with me here over the next few minutes because this can get a little confusing, but I'm going to do my best. So here's how it starts, this 1,000-year reign. Verse 1, I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding in his hand and the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. We've already talked about the bottomless pit earlier in the series. You can call this a, like a death row in a sense for Satan. Verse two, and he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who was the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. So Jesus is not doing this. Jesus is reigning. Uh, the, Satan, he's just, he's small time for Jesus. He delegates this to an angel to take care of Satan. Throws him into this death row. Notice what he calls him here, the ancient serpent. So let me stop yet again and remind us, where's the first time we saw the ancient serpent? We saw him in Genesis. And what did he do? He deceived Adam and Eve. How did he deceive Adam and Eve? He took what God said, God's word, and said, did God really say that? Did God really mean that? Is that the way it's really to be interpreted? When you start hearing that on social media or other pastors or the blogs or the books, you're hearing the hiss of a serpent. But this serpent now who deceives is thrown into this death row. And it says next, and he threw him into the pit, shut it, sealed it over him so that he might not, here's our word, deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. And after that, he must be released for a little while. I believe the thousand years are a literal thousand years because it's mentioned six different times of this literal time. Now, here's the question as we get into this. What will the earth be like then over that 1,000 years with Satan in this death row and locked up. Well, we go to Isaiah and we see a little bit about what's happening. We see first that weapons of war are, are, are no longer weapons of war, but, weapons, uh, uh, or but they're tools for the good of the earth. We see that 
Nations are not warring against nations anymore, nor nations learning war. Verse 6 talks about the calf and the lion, the wildlife will lie together. Talks about a child shall play and lead among the most dangerous predators on earth. Isaiah 12, 14 and following says there's joy and singing with Christ. And then there's this verse 20 that's a little bit odd, but it gives us more a glimpse into what's going on. No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. Now pause. If you're going, what? So have I. So we got to dig in what is happening then in this 1,000 year reign. Okay, stay with me. What has happened, as a reminder, we've already been with Jesus. We're coming back with Jesus and we are in perfect glorified bodies as we come back with Jesus and the nations are defeated. So not only are we with Jesus, we're with other, the other believers and we are ruling and reigning. Now, the question is, who are we ruling and reigning over then? Well, during the tribulation and even after this huge violent war, there are going to be humans still alive. Who, without, who, who did not have the mark of the beast and are still alive. So they are still in their sin. They can still die. So they are a part of that 1,000 years. So we're back. We cannot sin. That's over. We are righteous in its fullness because of Christ, what he's done for us. We are in perfect glorified bodies. But those who are alive at this time are not. They're still sinners. That's why they can still have babies that's why you can still, they can still die. Not those glorified, they, they can still die. It talks, it talks about the curse. There's still that sin curse that is happening among humanity. So what's going on is this is not the final heaven. Death and, and hell and Hades has not been cast out yet. The curse has not been cast out. That's still very much a thing. So then the question is, <laughs> what's going to happen to that humanity then? Will they still have a decision to make? Will they trust Christ or will they reject him? And this is what blows my mind. I'm thinking if I've lived through all that horror and I've gotten to this moment and I see Jesus reigning, where's Jesus? He's right there. He's right there. I can see him. And I'm looking around at people who have died and now are resurrected, walk around their glorified bodies. I think I would look around and go, it's true. I believe. But would you believe there will still be people in that day who can see Christ and those resurrected with him and will still go, I don't know, man. Mm, I don't know. And they still won't believe how can it be, especially when Satan, the deceiver, has been cast out for a while? Here's how that can happen. You ready? Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Listen, I know what the love song says, but don't trust your heart. The heart is more deceitful than Satan is above all things. So don't trust your feelings. Don't trust your desires. First take them and put them on the Bible and let the scriptures speak to what is true. Don't be self-deceived. And I got to ask, could you potentially be self-deceived today? Mm. Now we get to verse four of chapter 20. We're reigning with Christ. The disciples are reigning Old Testament Messianic Jews, judging angels. And it says, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. I always want to pause here. The testimony of Jesus is the real Jesus, not pop culture Jesus. He's the Jesus who was born of the virgin. He's the Jesus who did miracles. He's the Jesus who went to the cross to die for your sin and mine. The lamb who was slain, meaning he was without sin. He took on the holy wrath of God, the hell of God that we deserved, went into the grave for three days, resurrected, defeating sin, evil, death, hell, and then ascended to the right hand of the Father and is coming again in judgment. If you believe anything differently about Jesus, you got the wrong Jesus. 
And the wrong Jesus will not save you. So this is his testimony. Then the word of God, the truth of who he is. And it says, and those who had not worshipped the Antichrist, the beast, or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So during the seven years of tribulation, there were people who placed their faith in Christ and they died over this tribulation time. So their souls are still in heaven. We've already been glorified because of what happened before the tribulation. But those who died during the tribulation, they've not been resurrected in their bodies yet. But right here it says in that thousand years, they too then, their bodies will be resurrected, their, their souls resurrected with their bodies as they died in that tribulation. This is the first resurrection. Then verse six says, blessed and holy is the one who shares in that first resurrection, meaning those who died in the tribulation and they're resurrected unto Christ and now reigning with him. Over such the second death, that's the final hell, has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Priest simply means you have access to the lap of God and to his heart like children will be and they'll be forever. Verse five, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. Those are the unbelievers. So whereas you had unbelievers and believers died during that tribulation, the believers who died during the tribulation now are reunited with their bodies to reign. The unbelievers who died during that tribulation and even here, their soul is in Hades. Hades, don't think purgatory. It sounds a little bit like a traditional understanding of purgatory. It's not. Purgatory says, when I suffer long enough, I'll go to heaven. Some people think purgatory is, I'll finally stand before Jesus, and then I can repent of my sins. It's not biblical. That's nowhere in the Bible. Or somebody, somebody can pray me out of purgatory. No, that's not even biblical. Hades is a place where the unbeliever's soul goes to torment, but not the final hell. And at the end of this reign, this, this thousand year reign of Jesus, now comes the moment the souls of Hades come out to reunite with their indestructible bodies. So if you're following me, we all receive these indestructible bodies, these glorified bodies. For the believer, you receive a glorified body so that you can withstand the joy of heaven and God himself forever. For the unbeliever, you receive an indestructible body where you will die in hell forever. I don't like this part at all, I'm telling you, but we got to deal with it. Verse 7, and when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations again that are at the four corners of the earth. And this is Gog and Magog to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. That's how many people will reject Jesus when they can see him right there. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. So here's a picture of the map, you could say, of what this battle will look like, this Gog and Magog. So you can see the nations we understand today, Russia, Turkey. And you can see how even today there's rumblings of this. But this won't happen until after the thousand years as the ultimate world-ending war. And you can see how the, the, the lines go. That's why it says the four corners of the globe. You can see how they all point almost in four different directions. And this will be the, Satan and the worlds in their final rebellion will turn and all descend upon Christ in Jerusalem and his people. And yet again, it goes bad for them. Verse 9. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Day and night means you don't die. Day and night forever and ever. And now what we find is what's called the great white throne judgment. So these are the souls after that 1,000 years, people who died without Christ, they've been in Hades, 1,000 years end, souls reunite with body, and now in those bodies, they stand before these unbelievers, before this great white throne judgment. And let's see what happens. Verse 20, then I saw a great white throne and him who is Christ, who was seated on it. And from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. Listen, 
If you stand before someone by which earth and sky run from them, wow, sobering. And this is where they stand. So these are unbelievers before the Lord who are to be judged. Verse 12, and I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. So you have great and small. You have presidents and kings and celebrities and fame. You have the common person just doing life. These are all the ones who have rejected Christ, and now they stand in this judgment. All ideologies, religions, whatever, if it was not Christ, they stand in this final judgment. And the dead, it says, were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead. That's language of soul and body connect, reuniting. Who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. So these books, I don't know if they're literal books. I mean, this, this is eternal, infinite realities that he's trying to grasp with earthly human language. But let's just say they're books. Well, there's the book that will be open called the Lamb's Book of Life. And those unbelieving will stand before him and it will be clear, as he says, your name is not in this book because you were rebellious and unbelieving in the true Christ. So there's the Lamb's Book of Life. Then there are other books I think one will be compared to. One I'll mention is the Book of the Law. So in order to be made right with God without Christ, you have to keep all the laws of God perfectly for your entire life. So if you go to the Old Testament, there are 600-something laws. To go to heaven without Christ, you have to keep all 600-ish of them perfectly without breaking one at any time in your life. Take the Ten Commandments. How you doing? <laughs> because if you break one commandment, says the Scriptures, it's as if you broke them all and you die zero for ten. To be made right with Christ or to be made right with God without Christ, you would have kept the commandments. You would have to 10 for 10. Because I've had people say, you know what? I'm a good person. I keep most of the commandments. Well, first of all, I would ask, how do you know you're keeping the right ones? And then secondly, God doesn't play like that. And so that, that it, put it this way. Whoever stands before God in that moment, there are no excuses. There are no, there's no rationale. There's nothing that can be said to defend oneself. That's over. It is nothing but white hot judgment in this moment. So the great and small, and it says, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books. The sea gave them up. Then in verse 14, it says, the death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. Pause right here. This is so heavy, but can we just take a moment and say, bless God's heart that death is cast out. It's, it, he's personifying death here in, in Hades, and I love it because Jesus himself, we see in his life that death is an intruder. It was never supposed to be this way. And, and we, we, we see and experience the death of loved ones, and it's, it's unbearable because it was never supposed to be this way. When Jesus was here, it says he wept over death. He snorted. This is scene <clears throat> where he snorted at death, anger, because it wasn't supposed to be this way. And now in these mo final moments, he's casting death and Hades into this lake of fire. Verse 15, and if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he, she was thrown into the lake of fire. For every one mention of heaven, Jesus mentioned hell three times. Okay, let's talk about this. I would never choose to talk about this, uh, but when you preach through a book of the Bible, you're forced to deal with what's there, right? And I've always told you, we're going to deal with the hard stuff, and this is hard. Speaking of hell... Let me, I don't even know where to start here. Hell was not for people. Hell is for Satan. Hell is for the Antichrist. Hell is for the false prophet. But if you have not been born again through faith in Christ, hell is where you go. It's so clear here. 
God does not choose hell for you. You choose hell for you. Hell is a door. C.S. Lewis put it this way. Hell is a door locked from the inside. If you, if you think of it, <laughs> if you go to Scripture and read carefully, there is nobody in hell wanting out of hell. They want relief, but they don't want out. Why would we think someone would live their life rejecting Christ and go to hell and all of a sudden want to go there because of pain? No, they want relief, but they don't want, no, they, they don't want Christ. Think of Revelation. Where have we been? When all that judgment, <clears throat> seals, trumpets, bowls, all that judgment has been poured out on the depravity of human beings. I have waited and waited for them to go, I repent, I believe. But what do we see every time? You see three things. One, they would not repent. Two, <laughs> they cursed the name of God. And then three, they wanted to die but could not die. That's hell. Torment, but I still don't want him. I will not repent. I will curse your name. And even though I die and will never die, I won't believe in you. That's hell, man. And people choose that. What are you choosing? Now, who will be there? Well, the scripture has a lot to say about this, but let me just land on this final verse. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death, meaning the death you will never ultimately die from. I could, I could spend a sermon on all of those, but the first, one I, first thing I will ask is this. Do you see yourself anywhere in that list today? Have you repented of whatever is in your life that's in that list? But the phrase I really want you to see is the second one, the unbelieving, the unbelieving. This is your future, the lake of fire and death forever and ever, unless you place your faith in Christ and what he did for you on the cross and his resurrection. As I've said throughout this series, God is under no obligation to explain himself to you or to me. And we've seen the goodness of the heart of God throughout all of history that seeks the hearts of every person. He delays his coming so that people will repent. He sent his son, the lamb who was slain for you and for me to reject all that God has done. This makes sense that this would be the destiny. Here's the question I'll leave you with. Is it safe for you to die? Is it safe for you to die today? Ain't nobody promised to even get to their car door today or to your motorcycle today. No one. So you better be right about this because forever is a long time to be wrong. Now, where do we go from here? Well, happy Monday tomorrow, right? <laughs> here, here's how I think we should respond, right? I think it should be this right here. We lift our hands and we lift our eyes and we lift our voice and we say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, who is to come. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain for me. Holy are your thoughts and your ways and they're fair and they're, they're deserving and they're right because you are God and you have saved me by the blood of your Son. Holy and worthy are you. Now this week, go live your life that way. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Lord, I pray for anyone under the sound of my voice that are unbelieving, that today is their day of salvation. They would believe, place their faith in you to be born again. 
and to live a life not perfect but repentant, to deny themselves and follow you and take up their cross. Lord, for all of us as we search our own hearts, I pray that we would rejoice that in Christ we have right standing with you and we have no fear. And that we can lift our hands, we can lift our hearts, we can bow our knees to you, O God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy. Worthy are you, Lamb, who was slain to give you praise.